The Internet of Things, a general term used to describe the connectivity between products. It has become common for any product to feature some measure of connectivity, a feature which, until recently, was found only in high-end electronic devices. Free from their isolation, our products now promise a future in which we can control every aspect of our lives with minimal effort. But for all the IoT's conveniences, it offers major concerns in return. We find that, as startups grow, the longevity of their design ethics tend to suffer. How do we uphold and maintain ethical values after production and services are up and running? We are the incredible machine, and we want to make something that is designed to do just that. A fair bike rental solution that uses blockchain technology and open source hardware. And we want to know if we can do it at the source of all hardware, Shenzhen. As a Dutch person, after you baby takes his first steps, the next life, big life event is when you learn how to cycle. In China, you can see that in the cities, there's a lot of startups that are placing bicycles there for everybody to use. It seems to be that there's a market that they really want to corner. Our concept, Velocracy, is a little bit different than the standard rental model. So there's no single company, no single party that can decide you know, what the prices are, how the system works, who gets on it and who doesn't. We want to have a system that's decentralized and open where it's really easy to join and actually you get a really fair deal when you're using one of these, these bikes. Velocracy is a bike sharing system that runs as a decentralized democratic organization. The main goals are transparency and a fair treatment of all parties involved. On the surface, Velocity doesn't look too different from other bike rentals. Much like the latest wave of bike rentals, Velocity will be dockless, meaning that users will have more freedom in where they park the bikes. The difference, however, lies in the way its funds are managed. Each lock will be managing its own funds. Due to the nature of cryptocurrencies, we can program what it should do with the money it collects. These rules, if you will, are stored in the blockchain and are accessible for anyone to see. So any funny business in the code will not go unnoticed. When a bike has made enough money, it will pay for the deployment of a new bike. And as long as there is enough demand for Velocity, the service will keep spreading across the city. This way, no central party gets to make service-breaking decisions after its deployment. A lot of these things are actually being built in China, in Shenzhen for instance. So for us it makes a lot of sense to go to the source of where those things are made and see how we can start there to create these products in a way that we feel fits nicely to the values that we have with Velocity. We are not the only designers who care about values. We had a chat with Alexandra Deschamps-Soncino. I think that when you're suggesting designing something that's a connected product, then you have to develop a set of values. It's There's no way out of it because you will be then creating an environment where data is being um, captured in order to support a service. Um, are your customers aware that that's really what's happening or are you obfuscating that behind the magic of technology? And at any point in that journey, you're going to have to make decisions. And that's where I think your set of core values as a designer comes in. You're either not fussed about it, in which case that says a lot about your personal values, or you care about it and you decide to design things accordingly. So every act of design ends up being a reflection of your values, I think. I find slightly distasteful uh, the idea that one would develop a product simply to harvest data so that it can be sold on to God knows who. I think if you give consumers the choice between something that they, something where they know what's happening and something where they don't know what's happening, at least they have a choice. 
Right now, they don't have a choice. Not everybody buys fair trade. Not everybody eats organic. But it's there. It's there as an option. To ensure that Velocracy stays fair, the project will be open sourced, meaning that all the project's documentation will be accessible to anyone online. More on open source hardware is Davide Gomba. Open source hardware is really, really relevant for the future of things. They are going to last in the future, while a lot of other products that are designed uh, and being are getting sold out or not sold anymore are lost. So to me, the open source hardware um, ethical approach is to give back to the people or to the to history. This doesn't mean that open source hardware business model um, is a reliable business model. It's more complex than it seems. But I love open source hardware, and I think is a super resilient approach toward things. To learn more about what it's like to produce something in China, we got the chance to talk to Fairphone's Miguel Ballester Salva. We are happy as long as we can establish our brand in the market, uh, and we don't necessarily need to become the biggest. You know, we are happy with having a position where we can use a company operations, our company operations, to keep on uh, to keep on raising sustainability issues and giving a certain alternative or a certain way of uh, tackling those issues. We uh, started Fairphone, in, uh, Fairphone as a company in 2013, so that was just before we went to uh, Shenzhen, among other places, to find the first manufacturer for uh, Fairphone 1. Ethical um, questions or responsible design or re responsible IoT in our case, um, how, how, how willing um, are Chinese uh, parties in general to talk about this? Um, it is important as well that we raise why is it important for them and also to forget that like it's not we having the answers and they not knowing everything, a anything on the contrary, like they are very aware of what the challenges are. Someone who has first-hand experience with IoT products in particular is John Tillema from Tweetoner. Oh, our experience is that they, all, they fully understand that correctly. In some things they're even a little bit for more uh, further ahead than we are here in Europe or uh, in the US. Getting there is the first is the first boundary. But if you're there, like prototyping iteration in hardware startups, there was no place in the world where you can do that faster and better than than anywhere else. I mean, you have everything there. If you can't do it there, it's you forget about it. So, any specific tips that you have for us? Uh, don't believe everything they say. Anything at all? Check everything. It should be. I mean, everybody will say, yeah, we can make it. Uh, no problem at all. A lot of companies won't admit that they really can do it. Yeah, start your research at the source and then there's no substitute like Shenzhen. There's no substitute like Shenzhen indeed. This is the place where rental bikes have flooded the streets in less than six months. It's hard to imagine that this giant metropolis was but a small fishing village only a few decades ago. The region in the south of China was declared a special economic zone by Deng Xiaoping in the 1980s, in the early 1980s. And that not only meant that this was a region that became particularly attractive to foreign companies because of tax reductions, but it also meant that the region here became in the eyes of political leaders a zone of experimentation. And in the same spirit, Shenzhen is experimenting with rental bikes today. For a 100 to 600 RMB deposit, users can scan a QR code and rent one for as little as half RMB per hour. Travel around the city and you'll likely stumble upon a few discarded bikes. Sometimes you will even find piles of them. Some of these bikes have been vandalized in attempts to manipulate the system. Apparently, people are scratching out QR codes and securing them with personal locks preventing anyone else from renting the bikes and effectively claiming them for themselves. These bikes have been deemed unusable and are collected for repair. There are also bikes that have been dumped in hard-to-reach places. These problems would plague the city if it wasn't for the very active maintenance staff that works on behalf of the rental companies. One has to wonder how long these startups can keep up with all this maintenance, especially once the companies can no longer rely on government funding. We want to prevent these scenarios with Velocracy. 
But as much as Shenzhen is a catalyst for hardware development, it is still, at least for us, unfamiliar territory. Not to mention that velocity is a far cry from the typical concepts that are developed in Shenzhen. Luckily, we are not the first fish out of the water here. Hax is a Shenzhen-based accelerator that has helped many foreign startups navigate the city's resources. Come here with the most open mind you can and learn as much as possible is, is the best advice anyone could have. I think that like to go against the idea that, that people are copying, which I don't believe is a malicious act here, but actually to utilize that to help you to understand more is a very powerful and enabling thing to do. One week is like a month anywhere else because the speed, the iteration cycle just becomes so much faster. The market's an open book that anyone can learn from regardless of what the product is. We started out looking for hardware at the place Shenzhen is arguably best known for. Enter the Huachang Bay Electronics Market. Here, the market stands act as a traditional distribution interface, but the deals that are made here involve volumes that would probably surprise you. There's a good chance this is where we find the hardware we need. We bought a few components that could work for a prototype. But before we actually go through the trouble of building it from scratch, we want to find out if we can get a ready-made solution from a manufacturer. So we went to a manufacturer of a smart bike lock that our fixer found through the magic of WeChat. If you're not familiar with WeChat, this app not only allows you to connect and communicate with other people, it also acts as a platform for other apps. Social media, marketing, money transfer, flight booking, you name it. You can even use it to connect to Wi-Fi. We had an off-camera chat with the bike lock manufacturer, and they agreed to help us out by providing a sample of their product. Theirs was a smart bike lock that had already undergone production. And it comes really close to our requirements as well. If all goes well, we might have found ourselves a supplier of a ready-made solution. For Shenzhen, they work in the breakneck speed. I mean, you guys came in in November last year, and you probably find one bike lock company. And if you do the same query today, uh, you probably find 30 ready-to-go solutions. Interestingly, we can also look at it as a forced open source place. Uh, if uh, you have a good idea, if you don't share, someone will figure out how to replicate it. The attitude of cooperation is pretty open. Uh, if you like their whole lock, uh, you want to put your logo on it, it's negotiable. Uh, if you don't like their casing, you like their circuitry, it's also negotiable. I thought we had a really good meeting there because they seem to really understand what we're looking for. They look like a professional uh, um, company. They, you could clearly tell that they have been working on IoT devices for, for many, many years. They had only recently finished their, their uh, bike lock, but it looked really good, like nicely engineered. Uh, so I had a good feeling about that. It was more sort of typically what you would expect from entering a Chinese manufacturer. I think it was a solid, a solid company, so yeah. I had a good feeling about that, for sure. Smart bike locks. A term that had gotten us nowhere six months ago now seems to be produced by more than a few manufacturers in Shenzhen. Our fixer told us that the sample that they wanted to give us was using an old board and we were told to come back the next day. In the meantime, we figured we'd try some of these bikes out for ourselves. For research, of course. The day has finally come. Today we will pick up a ready-made solution to bring back home. We sit anxiously as we wait for our contact to deliver the sample. I think whatever happens, we're not leaving without the lock. But as soon as the sample arrives, it's clear there's something wrong. Wait. 
Yeah, you have a log, but um, you were not supposed to uh, break this. Okay. Doesn't look really usable right now. Yeah. <laughs> if there's no instructions, yeah. fake promise, and no way to insert a SIM card, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it's a bit of a gamble. Like we we take it to Holland and hopefully it connects. Yeah. It won't. <laughs> <laughs> so we returned empty-handed. Like what? What happened? Yeah, that was total disappointment. Especially after the first time where we thought, "Wow, this is amazing! We got it. Shenzhen delivered." Yeah, like uh, the most promising lead. It seemed like, wow, it's. Unbelievable that it's uh, like so close to everything we yeah, needed, yeah. only small modifications needed. It, it was there on a silver platter and the thing was done, it looked great. They understood us, they wanted to help. We were almost shipped off with a lock, which didn't work. It would have no battery power, the wrong yeah. SIM, and we couldn't open it yeah. up. Uh, yeah. Only well. be because we asked like some questions like, oh, how on earth are we, so, are we supposed to use this lock? There's only two wires coming from it, with yeah. no instructions whatsoever. Yeah. And uh, after asking some questions, it seemed like uh, the, the battery is actually yeah. dead. Um, it's not, it wasn't even the right electronics board in there. Yeah, exactly. And um, I, was, I was almost ready to leave, assuming that it would, would be good. I think yeah, it was yeah. maybe our fixer that said, I don't think you should leave and pay them before we've seen it, it work. And yeah. it was really, really right. I mean, you can also say they really did their best. Yeah. I still believe they can do it. Basically what we should do is still try and get a sample, get it to work in Europe. Send them a list of requirements, ask if it's possible. <laughs> if they say it's possible, yeah. send the SIM, because otherwise it will be exactly no, the same. No, exactly, yeah, yeah. So we need, we need to have some extremely clear agreements with them about yeah. what we want. The ordeal has left us wondering what the correct approach would be to start the kind of partnership we are looking for. How can we build a responsible IoT product if something as simple as getting a sample is this problematic? We've been digging around and it seems that getting potential partners to cooperate isn't just a matter of having proper credentials. When we talk about sharing in the Shanghai sort of production culture, it's very different, I would say, even though it has overlap with sort of Western open source sharing cultures. So the difference is that it is a system that evolves through networks of trust. Um, so people would build relationship among these different sort of entities. This could take a variety of forms in terms of how that plays out. So it's, it's typically a mix of face-to-face -face interaction, of meeting one another, visiting one another, um, but also extending to informal meetings over dinner and so on. The people who have seen are really successful in sort of embedding themselves into the sort of culture is, uh, first of all, language. You know, so there is um, typically, you know, uh, either people speak Chinese themselves or they bring somebody onto their team who uh, can help and broker these relationships. But in addition, you know, of course, with the sort of role of WeChat in China, you also see a lot of business transactions happening through WeChat. So some of the people I interviewed over the years, and this includes um, not just, you know, manufacturers or people in the sort of manufacturing world, but also startups or people who are working more on the incubator side of things, they would actually have a quite complicated network of, of uh, contacts in their WeChat. So I think you can do pretty much anything in that system as long as you speak that language of business, right? So let's say if you had, you know, an idea for an open source kind of product, right? And you had, you know, the means of, you know, funding its production, I would say you would find many people in, in Zhenzhen eager to work with you, right? Because for them, there is, you know, a built-in mentality of building for particular kinds of needs and desires, right? Sort of that is, in part, um, what drives the system. Um, 
注注重这个点，对，很很很少强调这个点，对，也是在就是这个体系不是很健全或者它高速发展过程中，当它进入一个比较平缓的成熟期的时候，在一个现在因为互联网嘛，其实全世界大家思想也在交流，慢慢大家肯定会更多的考虑去公平的事情，对。We think it's really important that our software is open source. We think it's the right thing to do. Do you think that the manufacturers would be sensitive to this argument? I think this is a value perception issue. Like Google, it's always been doing open source things. Apple has always been doing open source things. But the two companies now have a lot of influence in the world. So I think it's not open source things that are better than open source things. The key is to see if you find the right investors with similar values. And that will be possible here in Shenzhen. No, can be, can be. Shenzhen has many of them. Find the right partner who shares the same values. Advice that is hard to follow as an outsider. Luckily, we could once again look to our fixer to seek out the right people. We found someone with matching values at Chaiwa Makerspace, a tiny makerspace founded by Seed Studio. Our uh, viability in terms of business is a bit lower. We hope that it's more valuable for the end user, basically. Mm -hmm. Do people really understand that? Well, I, I get the feeling that you have no filter on that, and maybe you're more into the maker mentality anyway. Well, obviously. Our visit to Chaiwa Makerspace left us hopeful for our project. Open source projects are definitely being pursued here in Shenzhen. We visited parent company Seed Studio, who seems to be all about open source hardware. Um, yeah, we are interested in many open source um, products because if you're talking about the share bike, uh, the open source bike, um, I think this is important not only to use the bike from the giant company because Seed Studio already provide all these different kinds of modules. All you need to do is just plug and play with all these modules to prove the concept. And also after you prove the concept, you probably want to jump through the designing stage and hope to have your very first engineering sample. So we provide the service to help you consolidate all the modules together and put it onto one board. I hand your prototype to someone who understands this technology and good at small batch manufacturing. Just make sure your product iteration can go really fast. After our visit to Seed Studio, we wanted to see more. We paid a visit to X Factory, a brand new workplace open to indie designers looking to start their open source hardware project. Whereas Seed Studio seem to have their own production facilities, X Factory tries to collaborate with local manufacturers to fully utilize the expertise in Shenzhen. Projects like Velocity, I think that's the um, perfect examples for uh, what uh, X Factory wants. The sharing and openness, and that's the um, key. Yeah, X Factory is kind of like uh, routers between uh, maker pros and industry. We are trying to connect makers from all around the world and come to Shenzhen work with the industry here. The concept for X Factory is uh, open factories. So we are hoping to build projects that could showcase to everyone and influence everyone, uh, not just uh, here in China, but all over the world. While we are trying to uh, decentralize the manufacturing process uh, with open source hardware and, and to uh, embrace more innovative ideas. When you talk about open source and open source hardware, is that something that can be uh, difficult for traditional manufacturers to understand the philosophy behind that? I think uh, back then uh, it was, but right now I think the more and more uh, that the companies and manufacturers, they understand the power of uh, open source hardware. What we'll need is to have more uh, projects based on the open source uh, technology mm -hmm. and to actually influence the city and the environment I think that will be the uh, next step we should try to focus on. Yeah. Ethical and responsible IoT for me is it's a moving target. It's it's a goal to aspire to. You know, everybody should just like make the things as good as they can with the consumer in mind and with sustainability in mind. And that goes all the way from design processes to business models 
and everything in between. It's a really broad thing and it really depends on the category of product you're making. But all of that to me would be an ethical and responsible IoT. To realize that Shenzhen is not like, it's not all the same. They're like very different kind of parts of that ecosystem from like really big manufacturers down to like maker spaces. I think if you come from a makerspace background or a tinkerer background, the makerspaces might be a really good way to connect. Um, if you come from like a more corporate background, you might want to talk to one of the big design houses that take a lot of that like kind of nitty gritty just away from you and just handle it for you in exchange for, you know, for a higher price tag. But of course, it's not quite as easy. I think you have to also take the extra step of the quality control and making sure that what you mean is actually how the local manufacturers would interpret what you mean. So I think there's, it's just unsurprisingly, not all the glitter is gold and you have to really look at the detail to make sure that this stuff is implemented the way you want it to, which also means that you have to be really honest to yourself, like what your trade-offs are, what you're willing to pay, what you're willing to, to compromise on, what you're not willing to compromise on and really define what ethical means for any one of you. As a field research trip, it's totally fine to be there for a couple of weeks. But if you actually want to have the time to build the relationships, to build stuff on the long term, and to the prototyping, and the design, and to relationship building, I mean, that's going to take longer. Let's not lie to ourselves. It's not going to be easy. It's, it's going to be a lot more effort than just going on, uh, you know, going on Taobao and just ordering the thing and slapping your label on, which you know, has other advantages, but being necessarily responsible is not one of them. <laughs> we believe that technological advancements can elevate us, but only if we apply them respectfully, keeping in mind the well-being of our people, planet, and society. You were talking about uh, why we as a design agency care about responsible IoT, and that's, and that's exactly the reason why we're also passionate about creating this fair and inclusive uh, model for the sharing economy. And that's the reason why we started Holacracy in the first place. And then we thought, okay, Shenzhen is where everything's made. Maybe this is the perfect place to start looking for the first building blocks for our project. Shenzhen has an abundance of resources. Even for an open source blockchain based project like ours, these resources are ready and available for us. Companies are more than willing to cooperate. In fact, Shenzhen is very receptive to new ideas. Anyone looking to build a responsible IoT product can generally count on the people of Shenzhen to understand what they're trying to do, and they will likely have the capabilities to help you realize your ambitions. However, the primary language in Shenzhen is business. If it's just good intentions, it will be hard to get your project uh, off the ground. So they, they, they do understand the, the idea behind open source. It just doesn't seem to match always perfectly with the way they do business there. While the ideas behind open source hardware are well understood, the business hurdles they present have a strongly discouraging effect on most people you'll meet. So as, as long as, as it aligns with, with, uh, with the business uh, vision, then they're willing to do open source or, or um, have, have an ethical approach to uh, making products. I think that it's not a given that Shenzhen is the place for our project, but if we are uh, deciding that it is, then I know, I know better how to navigate it there. Building a trusted network of partners is key to getting things done in Shenzhen. And this is a practice that takes time. And then within you know, a number of weeks or a number of months, you will have your, your uh, product. Well, this is possible in theory. I think actually in reality, if you want to have a good product that really aligns with what you're trying to do, then you need to spend more time. Uh, but then still, there's a lot of opportunity that you can have in Shenzhen that you probably would not have in, in other places. Shenzhen is a highly advanced, buzzing ant pile of ambitious people. It's exciting, it's fast, and presents many interesting opportunities, even for a responsible IoT. And who knows, perhaps Shenzhen will one day become the undisputed place for responsible IoT products.